Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the third webinar of the Social Media Institute series. My name is Megan Murtis, and I will be your keynote speaker for this four-part series hosted by Illumina Foundation. I am a social media director for Trini Minds, a digital marketing agency specialized in higher education. I'm joined today by Shay Collier, our film director. And today, we're going to help you guys crack the code for a short form video. We'll be discussing the importance of social video, types of video, filming and editing best practices, and thought starters for creating content and measuring success. To get us started today, if you could please drop your name, school, and what your favorite platform is for consuming social video into the chat, that would be great. And I'll start, my favorite is TikTok because it curates a feed tailored to my interests, my age, location, and even sometimes my profession. So I also love how creative users uh, can be on there. Um, I feel like every time that I'm logging into TikTok, I'm learning something new. Oh, looks like we have a pretty good variety in types of uh, video platforms that people prefer. I see about half and half are Instagram and TikTok, but there are a few YouTube ones. I see a LinkedIn. Yeah. That's cool. I would say my favorite is also TikTok um, because it's fun I definitely like if there's like a product or something and I'm like I'm gonna go to TikTok and look up if people like it or not um but it's also really great just to get funny videos as well um and a good laugh that's a great point okay well um it looks like most of us have joined um we'll go ahead and get started just because we do have a packed schedule today um, so let's jump right into some of the challenges that prevent community colleges from successfully executing a social video strategy. Historically, marketing videos have been difficult for teams with limited budget, time, and internal resources. Up until the past decade, you had to use a professional camera to create compelling marketing videos. Smartphones have changed that. Content creators have proven that you, anyone can pick up a phone and film and create something that goes viral. So uh, what does this mean? It has driven up the consumption of social video content dramatically in the past few years. In 2023, users on average spent 17 hours per week watching social video. This growth is driven by several factors, including um, the increasing adoption of platforms such as TikTok and Instagram Reels. Um, and that's really kind of changed some of the trends that we've seen, um, moving to more vertical video and um, short form video. So how do community colleges keep up with the rising demands of social video so that they can remain relevant, top of mind, and foster engagement? Well, today we're gonna talk through uh, five key areas that will help you to better understand social video and how to start implementing a better social video strategy into your content calendar. If you remember from last time, we discussed how to craft a winning content strategy. So although we focused on static creative, uh, video deserved its own webinar because it is so such a huge part of your content strategy in successfully um, reaching people and garnering engagement. So um, we'll start today's session with a reminder of the power of social video. Then we'll discuss different types of video that you can use to incorporate into your video strategy. Shay will then discuss best practices when it comes to filming with a focus on filming with smartphones. We'll then share some tips and tricks to keep in mind that will help you with editing your videos. And then um, we'll provide actionable next steps, including content thought starters that will help you to start implementing today's lessons immediately. And please keep in mind that we'll have a 10 minute Q&A session at the end. Um, so you can ask any questions throughout the presentation if you'd like, but the last 10 minutes will be dedicated to uh, Q&A. So uh, let's start by looking at why social video is important. 
Um, Video isn't just another piece of content. It's one of the most effective ways to engage with your audience, and we have the facts to prove it. For example, did you know that brand association increases by 139% after someone watches a video? It's true. And not only that, but social media posts with video get 48% more views than those without, and 135% more organic reach on Facebook than uh, static images. Engagement is also much higher. Uh, we see 48% more interactions than still photos on Instagram. And engagement um, includes a couple of metrics, shares being one of them. In fact, 51% of people are more likely to share videos with their friends than any other type of content. I don't know about you guys, but I am very guilty of sending my friends a bunch of TikToks or Instagram reels. Um, up until this point, you may be impressed with these stats, but others in your organization may just want to know, what's the bottom line? Well, uh, we have stats on that too. Uh, in fact, 84% of people have been convinced to buy a product or service after watching a brand's video. And the same is true for higher education. And then lastly, 92% uh, of video marketers say it gives them a great return on investment. So with all of this data in mind, it's clear that if you aren't using video in your marketing strategy, you're missing out on huge opportunities. So to help you guys get started with social video, we're going to jump into some types of video, even really looking at a higher glance of um, when is it right for me to use um, to spend more time and resources versus um, doing a quick social video. So on one side, you have traditional video. Traditional video simply refers to the production process that has been around for much longer than social media. It's often professionally filmed with experts specialized in filmmaking techniques, long form storytelling, and highly skilled in video equipment production and set design. Traditional video is intended to have a long shelf life and is typically higher quality. Um, and the end platform for this might be uh, things like TV, websites, and email campaigns. So um, on the other side, we have social video. Social video is relatively new in the world of marketing. It has a much shorter shelf life because it's created faster and cheaper compared to traditional video methods. These videos are usually filmed in portrait mode and can be you know, less than 60 seconds long. So um, there's minimal cost and you can push out content pretty quickly to keep up with trends. And the key takeaway here is that um, between these two methods, you really want to figure out which one's best for you. Um, both have their time and place, but um, traditional video can be used on social media, but you cannot solely rely on traditional video for um, a good social content strategy. So jumping into those types of video, um, up first is stock video. Stock video is simply footage that's already been captured by a third party and is available for use through licensing. It's a great option when you need to convey broad concepts like diversity, education, and campus life without needing specific custom visuals. So think about campaigns such as back to school, holidays, or events that haven't happened yet, such as graduation in this example. So stock footage has its pros. It's quick, portable, um, and you can create professional looking videos. However, there are downsides. Um, it, they usually receive lower engagement because they feel generic. They don't feel like they're, you know, shot at your actual school or have uh, actual students or faculty in them. So um, to combat that, you know, we recommend using a little bit of stock video, but you need to consider other methods such as repurposing existing video. So perhaps you did a high quality video production um, a few years ago and you want to continue using that video because it has a long shelf life. Well, that being said, um, what you can do is take existing long form content that might've been originally created for something like um, a podcast or a uh, brand awareness campaign that went out on TV or social ads, and you can really adapt it for your organic social strategy. Um, so this saves time, it's cost effective and resourceful, but, what we need to keep in mind is if you repurpose existing video, you need to do two things. One, you need to consider your aspect ratio. So notice how this is 
in a vertical format, otherwise known as a nine by 16 aspect ratio. And you need to cut down the amount of time. So videos that are two minutes or longer really aren't gonna do well on social media. Really, you should be looking at 60 seconds or less, um, especially for like high quality productions like this. Um, up next, smartphone production. So this is the type of video that higher education and many other industries are trending towards using the most. It's perfect for behind the scenes, uh, quick trend develop, uh, driven content and much more. It's fast, affordable, and gives you content that feels relatable and authentic to your school. So this, while this has a lot of convenience, um, it's important to know that the quality is capped at 4K, so it's not ideal for content that needs to look really polished or professional um, or used on larger screens such as TV. So this is the go-to method when you need to prioritize quantity over quality. Oops. Um, and then in a stark difference, there is uh, high quality production. High quality production is top tier, is when you use top tier equipment, hire an experienced crew and produce highly polished content for the best storytelling experience. Think brand videos, program spotlights, or high visibility campaigns. This type of video is perfect when you need to make a lasting impact and showcase your brand in the best possible light. The downside is that it's the most expensive and time consuming option. So overall, it's uh, knowing when to invest in high quality production and when to go for something that's more nimble. Finally, we have user-generated content. The key difference between smartphone production and UGC is that someone outside of your organization or team is creating the, the content. So think students, professors, or influencers. User-generated content is perfect for showcasing the real life student experiences, campus events, or alumni stories. And the big pro here is social proof. People trust content that feels genuine and user-generated content delivers that authenticity. So it comes with its challenges. There's less control over quality and branding. So it can take time to collect, sort, and edit submissions. Um, we'll talk more in webinar number four about how you can partner with influencers and content creators um, to be able to procure more user-generated content. So now that we've discussed the methods of video that you can create, Shay will be providing filming best practices. Hey everyone, my name is Shay Collier. I am a film director here at Trending Minds. Um, I'm excited to be here today and just talk about some key insights on what you should keep in mind before starting your video shoot. So whether you're just getting started or you're looking to refine your process, these tips will help you get the best possible results for your project. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, first, we're going to talk about talent. Um, so there are some things to keep in mind when choosing whoever is going to be in your video. First, um, who is in front of your video is extremely important. Um, if we think about um, some famous movies, right? So there's no uh, Top Gun without Tom Cruise or no Devil Wears Prada without Meryl Streep. Um, so it's really important to pick and choose who you're going to have. So choose somebody who's relatable, somebody who can relate to your audience and who your audience can relate and engage with. Um, that's very important. Um, you also want to make sure you have somebody who's uncomfortable in front of the camera. Uh, I like to think about being in front of the camera as public speaking. Some people are really great at public speaking. Some people are terrified at public, at public speaking. So you just want to make sure um, that whoever is going to be in front of the camera is engaging, is comfortable, and feels confident in front of the camera. We also want to keep in mind that diversity does matter, right? So we, especially when you're looking at college campuses, you want to make sure that you have people that represent every single person um, on that college campus. Um, and you want to make sure that you're representing um, people from different backgrounds, uh, genders, um, and other things like that. 
the other thing you want to keep in mind is release forms. So release forms are so important. They are a must. So this is a great way to protect you, protect your organization, and also protect your, your talent or your actor. Um, every release form should include a few things. So permission to use the talent's voice, performance, and likeness. That's, that's key. That's very important. Um, you also want to include the terms of compensation. So even if somebody is doing it for free or just volunteering, I would recommend still putting that down on the release form because that is really important. Um, and then in terms of the length and their likeness uh, and when it will be used. So is this going to be something that is used for a few weeks, a few years, and definitely um, just making sure you put that down to protect you and your organization. Um, and finally, you want to make sure that you put down uh, who owns the rights to the footage that is being shot, um, whether it's a freelancer or your organization, your college, um, or if that person also owns the rights to it as well. Um, and just quick reminder, if you do have somebody who is under the age of 18, um, make sure that you also get a parent signature uh, because uh, they are not adults yet. Um, next, we're going to talk about scripts. Um, so scripted versus non-scripted. Um, this is important to think about before you uh, start filming your video. So a script is really great uh, when you have the time to create one. Um, and also if you are wanting to make sure you say something very specific. Um, so the great thing about a script is you can plan ahead. Um, you're not surprised at what anybody's going to say because you wrote it down for them to say. Um, and that also helps with editing because uh, whoever's editing the video won't have to listen to the entire video um, and then piece together things. They already know what's going to be said and they can splice things together. Um, and then this is really great if you're having like informational videos, tutorials, talking heads, things like that. I think that's really awesome. Um, the only thing about uh, script scripted videos is they don't feel as authentic. Um, and that's really important in some videos to have an authentic um, actor or somebody who's being them their true self. Um, so it can limit your talent um, and it can also make pre-production longer um, because you will have to write the script and then, you know, probably get it approved. Um, and also keep in mind that it might not be accessible to everybody. Um, some people uh, might not be able to read a teleprompter um, or you might come into some complications uh, with language. So just keep that in mind. Um, when it comes to non-scripted, non-scripted um, is really great if you want just an authentic feel. Um, so it's really awesome because this is great for man on the street um, or things like that. So people can say and be themselves. Um, this allows for really great unplanned moments as well. Um, some things you just can't plan out. And so um, it could actually benefit you. Um, and then also it can be less pre-production because you might have to write one or two questions instead of writing an entire script. Uh, the problem is though, um, editing might take longer because the person who is editing is going to have to listen to every interview or every speaker um, and then have to splice it together, unlike with scripted. Um, and then you also don't know what's going to be said. So, um, you know, you might get somebody who says something and you are like, that is not what I was going for. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. And it also, you know, might not get exactly what you want. If you want somebody to say something exactly a certain way, um, you might not get that with non-scripted. So both of these approaches are are great for certain projects. Um, there's no right or wrong way. Some just might be better for certain uh, productions than others. Um, so next we're going to go into where to film. This is extremely important. Um, not every place is going to be perfect for your video. Uh, so context matters. Um, if you are talking about your college campus, um, you might want to film on your college campus. Uh, you might want to film 
in front of something that represents your school very well. Um, so make sure you're doing that. Um, minimize distractions. Uh, you don't want to be in a place where there's a lot of foot traffic. Uh, you want to make sure that there's not a lot of background noise or not a lot of visual clutter. Um, so what can happen is if you're in a place with a lot of distractions, it can not be well for good for audio lighting and you know people can photo bomb your video um and that can be funny sometimes but most of the time it can be a little annoying as well um you also want to consider light so lighting um is extremely important you want to be able to see the person speaking um so if you're in a dark room or you're inside uh that might not be the best place. Um, but if you're outside, you want to make sure that you're not in direct sunlight. Um, maybe go under a tree or stand next to a window or something like that. And then you also want to make sure that you have permission to film at whatever location you are going to. Um, so if you are on your college's campus, um, I would just double check and make sure, hey, you can film here and you can show this. Um, and if you are going to a public place, I would definitely suggest calling ahead and seeing if you need a permit or if you need permission. Um, next, we are going to talk about uh, just cameras and smartphones. So smartphones, we all have smartphones or most of us have smartphones um, and we use it sometimes just to make content for ourselves, but it's also a really great way to make content for your organization um, because one, it's cost effective and it's easily accessible, um, which is great. So there are a few things that you can do to elevate your video um, and ways that you can change your settings to make this the best production possible via smartphone. So one, you want to make sure that you have enough storage um, because you should be shooting in 4K and at 30 frames per second. Um, 4K uh, is bigger files. Um, and that means that the the longer you shoot, the bigger the fire will be. So I would hate for you to make a video and shoot for 10 minutes in 4K, and then you hit stop record and it says not enough storage and you lose all of that content. Um, you wanna make sure you're filming vertically, um, especially if you're using this for social media like Instagram Reels or TikTok. Um, and you wanna make sure that you're using that back camera. That back camera in most cases is gonna be ideal. It has better quality and higher resolution. Um, you wanna make sure to lock in your exposure to avoid any light changes. So the light can change, especially if you're outside or if somebody moves. So you would just wanna make sure that you lock that in um, to give it more of a professional look. Um, and then you also want to keep framing in mind. So you want to turn on your grid settings um, and make sure that you're not angled or that you're not cutting somebody's head off. Um, and then again, with storage, if you are going to be shooting on your smartphone and you're going to be keeping those files on your smartphone, I highly recommend also making sure you have cloud storage. Um, phones can break, phones can get lost or stolen, um, but you wanna protect your files. So the cloud is the safest way to protect those files. Some things that you don't wanna do when it comes uh, to smart cameras is uh, if you're filming, you, don't, you do not wanna manually zoom. Um, so you might want either do some of the presets at two times or three times zoom, or if you have the opportunity, you might just want to get a little closer to your subject. Um, don't use cinematic mode if you have two or more people in your video. Um, this is a really great uh, amenity that like iPhone offers and some other uh, brands as well offer. Um, and it's great for one person, but once you get two or three people in there, um, it's just not able to capture focus on all of them. Um, and then you do not want to text or email your videos. So uh, when you text and email your videos, um, it tends to degrade the quality. Um, so if you have the option, I would upload it to Google Drive or uh, airdrop it to yourself. Um, next, we're going to talk about some other options. So um, if you do want to take video, uh, your video to the next level, professional cameras um, are a great way to do that. Um, so smartphones will definitely be great for user-generated content, um, but, but professional cameras um, and smartphones uh, definitely are not the same, um, and they will always be better quality as of now. Um, so things to keep in mind 
um, when you're looking for a professional camera is the sensor size. You just want to make sure that you have a full frame. Um, the resolution, we're in 2024, so anything under 4K um, is not worth buying. Um, and then the dynamic range, which just basically uh, captures the information of the shadows and the highlights and gives you a better picture. Um, and then there are some camera recommendations that I put down for you that um, all are in different tiers financially, but also are really great options for anybody at any time. Um, so following that, we're going to also talk about equipment. So equipment um, is not necessary for every video, but it will definitely help you out and help your video out. Um, so the great thing about uh, tripod staplers and gimbals and audio equipment is that there is um, equipment for phones as well as for professional cameras. Um, so you can choose whichever one is right for you. So tripods are really great if you have a long video and you need to make sure that uh, your camera is kept steady. Um, and then stabilizers or gimbals are really awesome if you are doing walking b-roll of an event or a walk and talk interview. And this just keeps your footage from being shaky um, and it just helps you uh, create a high quality video. And then audio equipment is important as well. Um, everything has internal microphones. So your iPhone has an internal microphone as well as uh, your camera will have an internal microphone. Those are okay for some things, especially if you're not going to be using the audio, but uh, you might want to invest in an external microphone. Um, things like lavaliers, which are ones that just clip onto your shirt are really great or boom mics or shotgun mics are really awesome for directional audio as well. Uh, moving on, um, we're gonna talk just a little bit about lighting. So lighting um, is huge uh, and you wanna make sure that your lighting looks good in your video. Um, natural light is, is natural, so it comes from the sun. Um, it's anything uh, that you can't plug in basically. Um, so natural light is something that is free and great to use, but there are some rules. So you might want to avoid going out between the hours of 10 to three o'clock um, if you have no shade around because um, the sun is at its highest peak and you will get some really harsh shadows if you do that. Um, some ways to avoid that might be to either stay indoors and stand by a window, um, or you can stand under a tree um, or an entryway, um, that can also help. Um, and then there's artificial lighting. Artificial lighting is just man-made lighting. So this is like LED panels, ring lights, um, and other lights as well. So the great thing about artificial lighting is that you can control the lighting. You can go anywhere and you can control what that spot looks like via lighting. But um, some things to keep in mind is if you do have a light um, and it's not battery powered, you want to make sure that you do have a place to plug it in. Um, I'd hate for you to get to a place and be ready to go. And then you're like, oh man, we don't have any place to plug in. And so the light won't turn on. I've been there and it's not fun. So just keep that in mind. Um, next, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, framing. So framing um, is really important when thinking about uh, the quality of your video um, in post-production as well. So one, you want to think about where is your video going? Is your video going to YouTube or is it going to TikTok, Instagram Reels? All of those things are great to keep in mind. Uh, you want to make sure that if it is going to a place like Instagram Reels or TikTok, you're shooting in a 9 by 16 frame. Um, but if it's going to some place like YouTube, you might want to shoot in a 16 by 9 frame. Also, uh, you want to make sure um, that you leave room for graphics or closed captions or text if you are going to be adding that. Um, you want to make sure that there's some headroom. You don't want to cut somebody's head off with the camera. And you want to make sure that your subject is centered within the video. Um, so next, we are going to go over to editing best practices. So uh, Megan, thank you so much. And go ahead, take it away. Thanks, Shay. All right, so uh, to get started in editing, let's dive into pacing and flow. Um, the average human attention span is diminishing. So the first thing that we have to remember is the hook. 
about 20% of viewers drop off just within the first 10 seconds of a video, which means you need to capture attention immediately. So make sure that the first three to five seconds deliver something compelling. So whether that's using a trending sound, an intriguing question, or a bold statement. Um, once you've got their attention, keep the video short and concise. Tailor the length to the platform that you're using. For instance, Instagram and TikTok, 15 to uh, 60 seconds is really um, optimal, especially for brand pages. Um, Facebook and LinkedIn, you can go a little bit longer, about one to two minutes. And then YouTube is um, really meant for long form content, unless if you're using YouTube shorts. YouTube shorts have to be under 60 seconds. They can't be longer or else they are not considered a YouTube short. Um, next, consider um, natural flow and cutting redundancies. So you want to make sure that um, you have a logical progression to the video. So each cut should feel intentional, moving the story forward without feeling um, like it's lulling or um, just repetitive. So maintain momentum and avoid dragging things out. And you can even use B-roll to help with that. Next, visual consistency. So to get started here, you want to start with uh, color grading. Um, you want to maintain a consistent color scheme throughout the video, and you can even save this as a preset, especially in CapCut for future use. So maybe um, you're adjusting the exposure or um, increasing or decreasing shadows or white balance, those kinds of things um, can really help with, um, you know, areas that you're filming where there may not be great lighting or something. Um, then you want to consider brand alignment. So ensure that colors and graphics align with brand's guidelines. So um, when you're asking your talent to film, um, you may want them to wear school colors, or um, you might ask them not to film in, um, you know, something that's not on brand for your school, such as, um, you know, other clothing brands and things like that, that may be taking away from the purpose of your video. Other things, uh, optimize your aspect ratio, very similar to um, our last slide talking about timing, uh, you have to consider that aspect ratio. So Instagram and TikTok, I would recommend as much as possible use nine by 16 ratio. Um, Facebook and LinkedIn, you can use other ones like one by one, um, which is just a square, or you can even still use the uh, landscape um, or horizontal videos. Um, and then YouTube, you can go with uh, 16 by nine if you're not doing YouTube shorts. Uh, for don'ts, don't add a filter or any excessive transitions. Um, this example here is kind of uh, showing how distracting it can be um, when you implement too many filters and things. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, what works for your brand um, may is going to work on social media too. Audio, it's just as important as visuals in creating an effective video. So first, adjust your volume settings to ensure that your audio isn't too loud or too quiet. And many platforms like TikTok and CapCut offer features like loudness, normalization, which helps even out that inconsistency with your audio levels. Um, you can also reduce noise in CapCut. So we have um, examples here showing like where you can edit things and find them. Um, so normalized, normalized loudness will help you with that, um, as well as reducing noise to cut out, cut out anything that you don't want to hear and kind of bring that studio um, audio quality to your video. Um, other things that you want to consider, voiceovers. Uh, they are very popular on TikTok and Instagram, where you can record yourself um, and even use uh, like filters and things. Um, but let's say you wanna bring more of a human component to your video, well, um, a really great way is to uh, film a voiceover and explain things that are being shown in your video. You can also use AI voice, which helps with, uh, you know, creating that audio without um, actually having to include anyone's actual voice and recording themselves. So um, you can use the talk to text feature, which you can see here. You just type out in the TikTok editor and it will um, translate it to an AI voice, which you can choose from some of these. You can see Jessie, she's one of the most um, well-known voices. Other ones um, include the professor and the storyteller are pretty popular ones. 
And then lastly, uh, training sounds um, and lip syncing. So for any like trending sounds that you want to use and you want to pair it with that sound with um, actual video, you I would recommend going into the platform, selecting the sound, and then you can record it on your phone and actually hear it. That way you're pairing it up um, really easily. TikTok's a great place to do it, but you can also do it on Instagram as well. Music. Um, music can be a little bit challenging. So when it comes to legal rights, it's important to remember that businesses are limited to using music from commercial music libraries, providing um, platforms like Instagram and TikTok uh, with those uh, licensed you know, music that you can use. Um, you may only be able to use a very small portion of it. Um, if it's a more popular song, um, let's say the artist has given permission for anyone to use it on, the, on those platforms. Um, so you may have access to more popular music, but most of the time, um, you'll be limited to using third-party um, uh, royalty-free music from platforms such as um, Epidemic Sound, Artlist, CapCut's Premium Music Library, and Canva as well. So um, lots of opportunities for you to source music either on the platform or um, outside of the platform with those third-party uh, platforms. Uh, other things to consider, uh, make sure that the music that you select aligns with your brand tone and identity. So you want your music to complement the video's message, not distract from it. And let's say you have an interview video or something where someone is speaking. Um, it's okay to use a little bit of background music to help fill in that white space and not feel so, um, sometimes it can feel sterile when people are not speaking with um, you know, enough energy or uh, things like that. So um, adding in a little bit of music in the background can be helpful. Just make sure that you're balancing it so that you can still hear the person's voice for the most part. It should not overpower um, important spoken content. Then um, on-screen text is extremely important as well. 92% of viewers actually watch the video with their sound off. So um, this makes uh, on-screen visuals very important. So keep your text simple, clean, and in frame long enough for viewers to read. You can also use text overlays to highlight key points. Um, also quotes, display names, job titles, or even CTAs. Um, so make sure to keep the text within the safe zone. So you can see that here. Um, this is a nice little guideline. It gives you those actual dimensions. So when you're creating something in say Canva, CapCut, um, Adobe Premiere uh, Pro, those kinds of things, you're able to get a good sense of where uh, those native features are going to be. So um, on Instagram, your caption usually goes here to the right. You're going to see your engagement counter. So it'll include likes, shares, comments. So um, and then don't forget um, at the very top right about right here, it'll say reels on Instagram. Um, TikTok doesn't have that, so you don't have to worry too much about the very top portion on TikTok, but always keep in mind the bottom and the in the far right are the, the, you know, the area that you don't want any text or important visuals to be. Next, um, to caption or not to caption? Um, this is a great question that's always up for debate. Um, when it comes to captions, Keep in mind your audience so you can add open captions to help ensure that your audience is getting the full message for lengthy content such as interviews, tutorials. Really, I like to use open captions if it's a really long video and you might lose the audience um, or it's about a complex topic and maybe they they have no idea what um, a word means. Um, that's a really great use for um, open captions. However, um, open captions definitely have their limitations. So uh, you can't change them once they're, you know, turned on in the platform and they're set to one language. If you were to say go with closed captions, um, almost every social platform will allow you to auto generate closed captions for your video. Um, you just have to make sure that you enable the setting and then you want to go back and check to see if your closed captions were auto generated correctly. Um, a lot of the times, if someone's not speaking very clearly, um, then it will mistake a word. So just go back and check that um, before you publish it and you should be able to edit it manually. And 
Um, the best part is about closed captions is that it will auto translate. Um, so whatever the original language was, let's say it was English and we want to translate it into Japanese, um, it will do that automatically based on the individual user's language preferences. So ultimately we suggest using closed captions for the most part and open captions for that lengthy, more complex topics. If you are interested in generating um, open captions, which is where it's you know on the screen, um, then you can use platforms like CapCut to auto-generate that for you. So it does take some of that time out. You can also use like ChatGPT to help to um, get those auto-captions generated. Um, that way you're not manually typing everything. Uh, then we have uh, editing software. So we have a few options here. There are more, but these are uh, based on the survey that we sent out earlier uh, this year. Um, we really found that a lot of you were using Canva, CapCut, and um, Adobe Creative Cloud. So um, I will say that picking the right software for you can really depend on your personal needs and experience. So we really put these in order of um, most complex to, uh, or sorry, from least complex to most complex. So um, there is a steeper learning curve with uh, Adobe Creative Cloud. A lot of people will go and actually get like certifications in it or take classes. Um, DaVinci Resolve is another one that's, um, it's currently has a free plan option, but it is a lot more complex. Um, Canva and CapCut both have free options as well, and they're much easier to use. They do have their drawbacks. I would say Canva is the most difficult to do video editing in because it doesn't allow you to go frame by frame when you're cutting your clips. It's got its benefits though. It's got um, a lot of uh, video uh, content that's free or available for um, a pretty minimal price um, if you wanted to do Canva Pro. So lots of stock video in there. And then CapCut is always great because it's kind of the in-between um, all these options. So it's not um, as simple as Canva and it's not as difficult as DaVinci. So definitely recommend checking these out. And there's plenty of resources online to kind of help you get started and learn a little bit more um, about each of these if you want more tips and tricks. So uh, now that we've just we, now that we've covered all of the basics, let's talk about how to actually get started with creating video content. So one of the best ways is to uh, get started with some simple, engaging ideas. We've gone ahead and uh, created just a few thought starters. So um, for video that you can do that's kind of evergreen. You can do day in the life, student takeover. So this would be working with um, say like a student ambassador, showing off their daily routines, giving perspective um, on what uh, campus life is really like. Campus tours are also um, very popular. Um, there was a recent trend that you could have like incorporated, which was, um, fast tours. Um, it was um, something that really resonated with Gen Z. So um, campus tours are always a great idea and they're pretty easy to incorporate trends in with as well. Um, How-to tutorials uh, are um, great too. So you could maybe do a video on um, applying for financial aid or registering for classes. So these videos provide um, a lot of valuable information. Uh, time lapses are also another simple one. That's just a setting that you change your uh, smartphone to um, within the camera app. You should be able to swipe to get to time lapse. Um, the important thing about a time lapse is use a tripod. That way uh, you're not moving it around. Um, and then it needs to uh, film for um, usually two to three times longer than you would um, to get the output. So um, let's say you want like a 30 second video, then you need to film um, for two to three times what that would actually take. So um, all of these ideas, you can click on these links to uh, see actual other examples, um, but we'll continue on with a few more. Um, we have a uh, Meet the Professor series. This um, is great for um, having you know new students um, or current students looking to take a certain class, they can get to know the professor a little bit more. You could host a Q&A session. Um, you could even do this um, 
to go back to the last webinar that we talked about, like the Instagram stickers, you could do um, host the uh, Q and A session um, where people can submit <coughs> any questions that they may have through Instagram, and then you kind of pick which ones you want to answer in a video. Um, then we have myth versus uh, reality series. So this can address misconceptions um, such as, you know, community colleges don't offer um, extracurricular activities. And then you can show um, plenty of uh, activities such as um, we have this Latin dance, Latin dance club example. Um, and that kind of ties into the next one, just, you know, highlighting those academic programs are really um, great pieces of video content and usually easy to capture. Um, and then uh, look ahead series teasers. So you could produce short um, preview videos of upcoming campus events or new courses um, to generate excitement. So um, with all of these thought starters, best practices in mind, we just wanted to um, kind of wrap up with a few reminders. Um, the first being on post frequency. Um, video post frequency, the more you post, the more you're gonna see um, engagement. So um, it kind of varies depending on the platform. And these are really just recommended for, like this post frequency is recommended for people who um, aren't even posting um, one video per month. Like this is a really good place for you to strive for because it's not, it shouldn't be too difficult to get to, especially if you're incorporating things like stock video, repurposing existing video, those kinds of things. So um, TikTok is the one that's the most difficult. Um, it is recommended to publish one to three times per day. Um, if you even do one to two per week though, you can still see results. Oh, thumbnails are also very important because um, while most people don't really see the thumbnail when the actual video is published, users will go back into your profile and they'll scroll and see what you've posted recently and they'll click on content based on that thumbnail. So um, just keep in mind that you should have a compelling headline. Um, don't just use a thumbnail that's from the video, actually try to create something or incorporate it into the video. Um, so that's always really good. And keep in mind that on Instagram, the grid will only show the middle square part of your video. So let's say you have a nine by 16 reel, well, the one by one ratio in the very middle is going to show the thumbnail. So just keep that in mind um, that most of your text should be in the middle um, 1080 by 1080. Um, follow, some other things that you can do, follow other schools and pages for inspiration. We talked a lot in the last webinar about this, um, some resources that will give you ideas. Um, Make sure that you're using a combination of short form videos and longer educational content, kind of sprinkle that throughout. That was, again, another tip from last time. And then um, work with internal teams and uh, student ambassadors to procure content. So, and our final recommendation when it comes to getting started is to measure success. It's difficult to know if your video is paying off unless if you're doing reporting. So there are a few key uh, KPIs that you should monitor to gauge how well your videos are performing. Um, view count is a good top line metric, but it's important to go deeper. So look at engagements, engagement rate. Um, that'll tell you how many people are liking, sharing, commenting on your videos, and how well it's really resonating. Uh, watch time and average view duration are really great for knowing when people are dropping off um, in your video or if they're watching it to um, completion. And then lastly, um, especially for um, more important videos that are um, on heavier topics or have like a specific goal in mind, let's say it's um, recruitment, um, you're gonna wanna look at clicks, click-through rate, conversions, and conversion rates. So um, keep those in mind. We did provide some higher education engagement rate benchmarks that you can use when um, determining whether or not your videos are performing well. So uh, that concludes webinar number three. Uh, today we covered a lot of ground. So just keep in mind that, um, you know, video is your top performing uh, piece of content that you can um, share. It's the, the type of video that you're gonna share is really gonna depend on your goals, 
um, your uh, type of video that you're sharing, um, consider talent scripts, um, all of those things that we talked about with filming best practices, um, editing best practices. It's really good to just start getting into the platforms and playing around with audio, music, on-screen text. And then lastly, uh, post often, post often and consistently. That will help a lot. Um, so uh, I know we covered a lot and we really weren't able to get into uh, really tactical things. So um, our additional resource for today's webinar is smartphone filming best practices. So this will include a lot more of that information that we really just didn't get to talk about, like um, the auto focus, auto exposure, um, what settings that you need to set your camera to, those kinds of things to get you better video. So um, with all of that in mind, um, we will jump into the Q&A session. And I will say we have, uh, we will be providing this uh, presentation to you all. So um, you'll have access to all of that as well as that additional resource in the next few days. Looks like we have a couple of questions coming in. Okay, so this is a great one from Edwin. Um, we have a question about how do you render multiple versions of the same video to accommodate multiple aspect ratios for multiple channels? I completely understand the uh, challenges with this one. Um, so let's say in Edwin's scenario that we have a video that was created um, maybe it was a campus tour or an enrollment video, an updated one, and it was shot in um, landscape, which is you know horizontal. If you have a video like that, um, the best way to adjust this quickly is to use platforms um, such as um, Adobe Premiere Pro. Uh, I like to use CapCut a lot um, because you can take this long form video and they have uh, tools and thing and like settings where you can take a long form video. It'll make recommendations for you to make it a short video. Um, so it'll tell you like which parts are the most compelling. Um, it'll also automatically change the aspect ratios for you. You just have to go through and um, make sure that when it crops it, that it's on the, the subject, right? So not every single frame is going to work. So you have to keep that in mind that you're gonna have to take some um, of the content out a lot of the times, unless if you purposely were filming with in mind that you wanted a vertical ratio. Square usually isn't as big of a challenge. So, um, but anyways, that's kind of what I would recommend when it comes to those two. And then um, Brianna has one for sharing. Oh, oh, I just lost her one. Okay. For sharing user-generated content, does simply getting permission to share content in a DM enough? Um, or is it better to send a permission slip every time? Um, this, again, kind of depends on your school. And I would talk to um, if you guys have anyone who is in charge of legal at your school or um, a consultant talk to them because it all depends on what um, your legal team says. Um, other things that you can use are um, if a lot of the times when students enroll, they have to sign um, you know, uh, paperwork and things that say uh, that you're signing up for like any photo release if you're on campus for that day um, or just campus in general and people are taking photos. So um, sometimes that may be enough, but it doesn't hurt to ask. I usually like to just ask in a DM, um, especially if they tag us, because um, you may not know if they're a student or not. So, um, but you saw that they they mentioned you. So, um, I always like to at least ask in a DM. But uh, yeah, you don't have to always have a uh, you know contract actually built out where someone signs it. Um, that's really just dependent on your school.
Um, I can talk more about conversion rate. I saw that Meredith asked that. So conversion rate is um, a way that you can determine how many actions are being taken. And a conversion can be based on really whatever action that you want to consider. So maybe you just want people to apply. Um, well, in order to do that, you need to get on your um, school's website, make sure that um, conversion tracking is set up. So um, that includes probably working with your web development team, making sure that they have code set up on the website um, through Google Analytics that will track how many um, times people are submitting a form. It's a pretty complicated process and not something that um, most people will feel comfortable like getting in and doing. So I would definitely reach out to your web team, ask them like, hey, do we have conversion set up, conversion tracking set up for this? If not, um, then they can usually help to guide you through the, the proper steps to connect Facebook, Instagram, all those platforms to your Google Analytics and make sure that everything's getting tracked. So I see one um, about uh, smartphones. Um, if your school doesn't allow you to buy um, a phone uh, to shoot video, are there any great digital cameras that you can use? So um, I would suggest looking into um, a vlogging camera. The great thing about vlogging cameras is it comes with a lens already attached. Um, it's lightweight, it's easy, um, and it's known for being able to shoot um vlogs or social media video. Um, so that's a really great starting camera. Um, and then there are also some professional cameras if you, you wanna spend a little bit more money or you wanna elevate your video even more. Um, but all of those are also be um, in uh, this slide, this slideshow that you guys will get. Um, so yeah, that's one, that's one thing that you can do. Um, and they are typically under about a thousand dollars. We have just a few minutes left. It's hard. There are a lot of questions. So um, I think I'm going to go next with uh, Nikisha's question. Thoughts about reposting the, and I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong. Uh, thoughts about reposting the exact same video multiple times on the same platform. How much time should you wait between reposts, such as several weeks versus months? So um, in most cases, I try not to share the same video um, at least a few months in between. Um, I do feel like people notice that you're sharing the same video. And I know it's tough because you may have very limited access to um, existing footage that's, you know, great quality. Uh, but I would recommend waiting a few months, um, not even weeks. Um, you can try to do other things and ways to kind of repurpose and like spice up the video, like adding new text on it, swapping out the sound, um, cutting it to different lengths can also help and using different um, thumbnails is also good. Um, as far as best format resolution, frame rate and color profile to render videos, um, 4K is great, but the problem is when it comes to, uh, and this kind of goes into Doug's question. So when you're trying to upload a video into say Sprout or Buffer, Hootsuite, those kinds of things, there's usually limitations as to how big the file can be or even dimensions. So 1080 by 1920 um, is gonna be your 1080p resolution. Um, that is also fine for most platforms. Um, the only time that I wouldn't say not to go with 4K um, is for YouTube. I wouldn't do anything less than 4K on YouTube, preferably, just because it is known for um, its more higher quality content. Um, but yes, for recording in 4K, um, sometimes you might have to downscale it. You can always downscale things. You cannot upscale. So um, keep that in mind. And that gives you the most flexibility when it comes to posting on multiple 
multiple sites. And then I do see quite a few questions about just user-generated content, student ambassadors and things. Um, know that our next webinar is uh, next week, same time, same day, and we will be talking about influencer and content creator marketing. That will have a lot more information about um, getting a student ambassador program started, when to work with um, you know, outside content creators, um, versus influencers, all of that information. So we'll get much more um, into those. But um, we want to thank you all so much for your time today um, and all of the thoughtful questions. We wish that we could answer them all, um, but we will be providing this presentation here in the next few days um, and as well as that additional resource. So we highly recommend you check out both.